I'm going to tell you something that is going to automatically evoke some imagery in your mind, some ideas about place and people. I grew up in rural Texas. That's the deal. Whatever associations that came up for you when I said that, I don't know if it can fully capture the excitement that I felt being freshly 18, moving to a college town, still in Texas, and feeling like the world was opening up and everything was new. And it was eight o'clock on a Monday morning, which was not really my, you know, time of day. Uh, or week that I thrived, but I was um, I was there 100% for it that day. And I'm pretty sure that I had planned my outfit for weeks in advance, even though I no longer remember what I wore. But I do remember Aaron Baker's hair, which was um, full on Robert Smith from The Cure, 1980s, glorious. And I want to let you know that Aaron still has a really strong hair game, so just be prepared for that. This was a really, really fun conversation for me to to go back to like day one of my my art school roots. And this conversation had a level of depth to it and an unexpected healing quality to it that I think a lot of people who have had the art school experience may connect with. We talk a lot about the complicated relationship that a lot of students had with Vernon Fisher, who was one of our painting instructors at, uh, at UNT in Denton, Texas, where we both went to school and met. And um, Aaron then went on to University of Las Vegas and did his master's work and studied with Dave Hickey there. So there's a lot in here that is specific to those two artists and their particular teaching styles. But within that, there are some universal threads in the art school experience and in the art world. And you can look at it as kind of a little microcosm for a lot of other stuff. There's also a lot of nitty gritty artists talking to artists about the minutiae of our different techniques, which are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. And it's not the only reason why I started this little project, but it is part of why I started this project. And I mean, when you're doing it, you're just in it and you're not really always thinking about why you're doing things in a certain way. And so I think just kind of like pull, pulling back and talking about that stuff with another artist who gets it is perspective shifting and confirming and expansive in all kinds of ways. So before we get into the conversation, I do want to give you a heads up that we had some connection issues. And so there's a, a few spots where the sound is a little bit glitchy, but I just want to let you know that that's there. And thank you for your patience through that. So, okay, so let's just jump in there. And I don't want to put too much pressure on you like right away, but I was thinking of what my first question for you was. And I feel uh -huh. like it's a very important one that's been sort of haunting me for <laughs> like 30 years. And what I want to know is in your painting, Mifo Crush, which <laughs> I was privileged to live with for a little while, there's a squirrel. I think it's a squirrel holding mm -hmm. a scroll. What is in the <laughs> scroll? What does the scroll say? <laughs> <laughs> I love that question. I love that question. Um, and of course, I love that you still think about that painting. You know, I would be totally lying if I said I remember <laughs> what, if anything, was supposed to be in that scroll. And it is totally possible that it was already in the hand of that character because part of the the genesis of that painting was me finding this book um, in the student union bookstore clearance bin that was called like tr trademark characters or something. Mm -hmm. And it was basically a book of trademark characters that had become defunct, you know, that weren't being used anymore. But at some point, sometime they were 
known for representing a certain brand or something. And so yeah. I noticed that so many of them were female animals. And so I started putting together this composition of all of these like beavers and squirrels and, you know, teddy, teddy bears and chipmunks and stuff. And that became like the background in that painting. And it's possible that that character was actually holding that scroll, but it also right. seems like likely that as a, you know, silly, somewhat pretentious undergrad art school student, that I, you know, I wanted to infer some greater, deeper meaning or wanted people to assume that there was some mystery to be unlocked in it. You know, and I honestly couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah, if that was if if the latter was the case, then it absolutely works because <laughs> all these years I've just been convinced that there's like some ancient mysteries that were like it's like saved from the the library at Alexandria like before it was burned and <laughs> like this wisdom, universal wisdom of like how to open a time portal or something, you know. I don't know, maybe. Well, I love maybe. that. I love that interpretation. And the fact that this painting has been, you know, I know it was in your house for many years and now it's in our friend Scott's home. And the fact that it has been kind of protected and shepherded from one friend's house to another brings me so much joy, Yeah, <clears throat> you know, and um, it's just really nice to know that it's still out there because having worked at, in the auction business, when I, when I first got out of grad school, that, that was my first gig was working for an auction house. And, um, you know, being around estate sales and then bigger auctions of like contemporary art and so on, you know, I can tell you that so many paintings just end up in estate sales or in like resale shops or yeah. whatever. And, you know, no one knows anything about them. And, um, you know, the most you can hope for is that maybe someone will buy it because it speaks to them or, you know, it looks super cool over their couch or whatever. And it will continue to have a life. And that's what I think is so great about auctions and estate sales is it does kind of allow artworks to continue to, to have lives, you know, but <clears throat> so many of those works, you wouldn't know, you know, the first thing about them mm -hmm. or the artist that made them. And not that me for crush has gone on to any great fame, but it's just nice to know that it, it's living out there somewhere. I have a very distinct memory too of like, so just for context for people watching the, the painting studio at UNT where we met was a like on one end of the building, a really long room had, a door on one side, one end, and you could walk through mm -hmm. and go out the other side and go like to the opposite hallway and access all of those classrooms that way. Um, and I had walked in on one end and you were kind of camped out in your little section that you had staked out for yourself, working <laughs> on like, just like, you know, with paint, like stippling this one little tiny little <laughs> section I think it was on the girl's cheek um, yes it would have and been, then yeah. I walked out like walked through the room left this painting studio went to a couple more classes you know had a full day and then I came back to the painting studio later <laughs> that afternoon to work on some of my stuff and you were still I mean in my mind you had not left like you probably had yeah. like left and gone to some classes but in my mind <laughs> you've been in that same spot the whole day like working on that same tiny little section because the work been. is so intricate and like such minute detail that it all like it always uh, I mean it's a it's an impressive feat I think it's one like you're one of those people who are like dude, that, that dude can draw, you know, like <laughs> get excited about your work because of the mm -hmm. like the pre precision of your technical skill. And then like, you're creating these really cool characters and it's fun and everything. But, um, I just was uh, like having done that kind of like stipple work. It doesn't, it's not something that I personally creatively respond to. And so it mm -hmm. always struck me 
you know, that that's the thing that you, that you do. Um, so do you want to like, speak to that a little bit? Like, what are you, like, what do you, what draws you to that? Or what do you get out of that very like precise, um, tech technique that you have? Sure. Yeah. First I would say, I want to say like, I loved your description of the painting studio because that is a room I think of often. And yeah. I was literally just thinking of it this week and um, how there was also like an enclosed room where I would go with my little opaque projector and I would do projections sometimes to trace some, you know, character that I had found in a comic book or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, I just think of that area and just those times of being able to be in there painting while seeing other people painting and the communal experience of like people side-eyeing your painting or trying to get a look at what you're doing or you know coming by and making a couple of comments and then right. wandering off and you know those art art school experiences are special for sure now having said that it was very nice of you to say that I'm one of those guys that people would say about like, oh, that guy can draw. But when we went to art school, that was not, yeah, you know, that was not something you wanted people to think about. Right. You. Like, you know, you wanted them to say, oh, you know, he has the smartest ideas or he's saying something very important um, <clears throat> that that's, that's going to resonate with the culture or whatever. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, having skill was kind of looked looked upon with suspicion and I remember being in in critiques and there would be you know really beautifully painted portrait or something yeah. and I'd be marveling at the technique and someone would lean over and go like well you know she's a good painter and that was actually like a slam that meant <laughs> she has no ideas oh my god she doesn't know what she's saying but she can paint you know so it's <laughs> I guess it's now having been an artist for so long you know it's nice to see that things come and go and you know my interests and obsessions and proclivities have stayed the same basically but that now we're in a time when you know it's like totally okay to make objects and yeah to exhibit some skill and right there's no one like dominant school of thought like there was so much in our day and um, because of the proliferation of social media and, and obviously the internet and stuff, it's it kind of anything goes. And as long right. as you are persuasive with it and you make a case for it visually, like you'll find a constituency. That's, that's what all of this has allowed us to do is find constituencies yeah. for our, our work. You know? That's a great way to put it. And the fact that it's the, the reach is global. And so, you know, it's not just like the American academic art school echo chamber. It's like to think that that would apply to what people are doing in China or India or like anywhere in the world really is just like ridiculous. Um, yeah. And it's we were it's, so insulated. Oh, my God. It's funny that you brought that up because I've, so I've, I just posted a video with uh, Brian Keith Jones, and then I also talked to Chris Kaiser and oh, cool. the exact same thing came up because both of them were painters, you know? Mm -hmm. And I yeah. was like, especially with Chris, I was kind of bemoaning the fact that um, I only had one teacher that ever taught any sort of technique. That was Rob Ertle in Mm -hmm. the watercolor classes and that's probably why I've gravitated to watercolor you know yeah but right um, I can see that in your but just that whole 90s like tough guy like the, there was a tough guy thing going on too of just like what you said of like it's got to be smart and it's got to be conceptual and it's got to be cynical and mm -hmm. you know, yes um so yeah. cynical yeah yeah, and um, cynicism. Rob, Rob was one of my favorite instructors too. I only took one class from him, but what I always remember about him was that not only did he encourage you to be, become a good artist in terms of your, your facility and your, you know, your technique, but he would be really hard on me. I mean, I thought I was, you know, pretty good at 
drawing and painting to a lesser degree, but painting, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and this particular day, measuring things. And I was, I was drawing a grid on a piece of paper and a big, big piece of watercolor paper. So it was probably, I don't know, maybe two, two feet square or something. And I don't remember how long his class was, but however long it was, I took the entire class to measure out this grid. Yeah. And he came over and he was like, so two hours later, Aaron can draw a grid, you know, and that's kind of like, <laughs> he summed that's up so my, funny. my life as an artist. Um, that's exactly now, what I was talking about earlier, though, is that like, like, I actually have a painting that I've been trying to start for a, about a like six weeks now. And part of it is just that, like, I don't really have a good space here. And so I, I use that as an excuse. But it's also just been there's been a lot going on these past six weeks mm -hmm. and um and part of the but like part of it for me is that it does require some measuring because it it has some typography in it and I hate yeah. that like that's just my least favorite thing to do but once it's mm -hmm. on there then I'm gonna have fun with it but that's the thing that like you totally get absorbed in it's yes seems that so, I mean, hearing it. hearing you say that, I'm like, that sounds amazing. Like, <laughs> to have to measure for hours before you start the actual work, right? Like, to to ensure that you're set up for it to be as perfect as possible before you actually start making any marks. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that really appeals to me. And to go back to your initial question of, you know, why have I always wanted to stipple? I started stippling to shade when I was at least in the sixth grade. And I say that because I still have this, uh, th this wildflower that I drew for the Texas wildflower contest. I don't know yeah. if you ever participated in that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. I mean, most of us did, right? For those of you watching, we grew up in Texas and um, I, I think I got an honorable mention or something and it was, my mom was really excited about it. And so I still have this drawing. And I, you can see that I colored it with colored pencil, but then I attempted to shade with a ballpoint pen, yeah. stippling, and it's like not that successful, but that was the first time that I know that I used that technique. Why it's continued in my work since then is really because, um, I mean, clearly it doesn't take a rocket scientist to assume it's about some level of control. And I think that's, you know, pretty fair. That's pretty accurate because someone will ask me, I just got asked this by a family member who was over here looking at something that was in progress not too long ago. Um, you know, what happens with this, since you're working in ink and you're stippling, what happens when you make a mistake? And I was like, well, you don't make many mistakes because it takes so long right. <laughs> to develop an area and to layer up these shadows that you have time to pivot you know it's like yeah. it's I think that's partly what's always appealed to me about that technique is just that it, it it you know it's like elapsing over a long period of time and it's very methodical let's see mm -hmm. what else can I say about it you know it's very meditative yeah um and obviously it you can find it in comic books and, you know, medical and scientific illustrations and a lot of kind of mid-century illustration in general. And um, those things have had various, you know, um, impacts on my work at one time or another. But I think, you know, it's just what I've always done. I started doing it as a kid and it's very comfortable for me and it allows me to develop things methodically over time which is just my personality I guess so. yeah yeah I like that uh what you said about it. it you know it kind of draws the moment out like that's absolutely like a whole a, a meditation thing of just like the the eternal now you know like you're I like that you've sort of translated that into your artwork with like each spot each little dot and actually the spaces between each dot is kind of where the magic is happening, like where your decision making making is happening, you know, like from this dot to the next one. It's like a blank, a lovely little blank 
space <laughs> where that's where all the juice is though you know that's so insightful of you because i get asked why i don't use tattoo pens you know those mm -hmm. tattoo pens that are just like you know right. i don't know if they've got batteries in them or how they work but they just stipple for you yeah and i'll get asked you know why i don't use one of those and honestly i've never tried so maybe it'd be amazing but just on the face of it, it seems like it wouldn't be a good fit because of what you just said. Like every time I make a dot, I'm immediately deciding where the next one's going to go mm -hmm. and how much pressure I'm going to put down. And, you know, and that's, this stuff isn't super interesting and it's not, my work isn't just about making dots, but that is why I don't think that the tattoo pen would, would, would work is because I'm constantly making decisions about like, this dot goes here, that dot goes there. This one's going to be dark. This one's going to be, you know, this one will be fat. This one will be small. Yeah. And I don't feel I'd be able to do that if I had this tattoo pen just yeah. going crazy. Yeah. But it's so know, fascinating it that to me, the, the ways that like people can get to the same place in a completely, you know, by taking a completely different route, you know, it's like, mm -hmm this very slow, precise, methodical way for you. And for me, like I would say the most meditative work that I do is the plain air work and it's completely gestural and it's mm -hmm. usually yeah. wet on wet. And so there you're, you're just letting it do what it's going to do. And I do it with my mm -hmm. hand. So it's kind of like finger painting, but there it's, it's very physical like, I think it's the physical aspect of it that is meditative for me. And then just being immersed in whatever natural setting that I happen to be in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what I admire about your work is what I admire about pretty much all of the painters who I like, um, who are so much different from what I do. And that's that they're able to make loose look tight. Yeah, You know, like gestural painting <clears throat> that looks very tight and resolved and cohesive is just so impressive to me. Like the idea of working wet into wet or working quickly mm -hmm. and having that control and having it be and having it look clean and look tight is, uh, you know, just so impressive to me. There's an artist, a friend of mine named A.J. Ainscoff, and he's a figurative painter. And... Um, yeah, his work is exactly that. I mean, it's super loose, but you can tell there's so much facility in it and it's just tight, you yeah. know? And so, yeah, you, you, you'll you read an interview with an actor and they'll be asked like, if, if you didn't do this, what would you do? And they they always answer like, this is literally all I know how to do. Right. You know, <laughs> me yeah. stippling and working the way that I do is literally what I know to do. Yeah. And so I, I admire artists who approach it differently. Yeah. Well, I, I feel the same way, you know, um, I, I, I've done very, um, detailed, realistic drawings, you know, I mm -hmm. can do that. It's been since art school really, but it's just not like, it's not my jam. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I, I understand what goes into it, you know? And so there's definitely a, a respect for, for that. Um, I appreciate you saying that about the, the, like the tightness of it, because I feel like that, uh, that particular style of, of art is the, the kind of art that people who um, we'll just call the general public, you know, and, mm -hmm. and there's a huge spectrum in there, but people who aren't into art, people who haven't really done much creating on their own and may not recognize like some of the technical aspects of, of something like to, to a lot of that audience, it just looks like a mess, you know, and I've had a plenty of people not even be able to see the image that I've drawn. Like they just see it as like mm -hmm. flashes of paint. And then like a month later, they'll be like, oh, wait, I see there's a mountain right there. And then there's this. And then I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it is like this, this one that's behind me, the square one, which is kind of like, it's a, it, that's not my plein air 
style that's a little tighter but um my nephews kind of like I had been working on that painting for a couple of years and then I moved and just like everything got disrupted and so I got I got interrupted and it it sat there and I kept wanting to go back to it and they kept like goading me like are you ever gonna finish that painting and so I finally <laughs> did and they every time they would come over like want to see the progress which was really cool like it it was like my nephews kept me accountable um so cool but then when I finally finished it they both were just kind of like mm, you know and then <laughs> and then like a whole year later one of them was in my room like telling me about you know his soccer game or something and he go he just was like kind of looking at it out of the corner of his eyes and then he was like oh they're flamingos and I, <laughs> I was like, I know, <laughs> like he yeah, has noticed that they they were flamingos. So it's yeah. kind of like, um, I don't know. Um, I just, I think if you are someone who does this kind of, that kind of work, you just sort of accept that your audience is going to be probably a little narrower, um, than people who are doing like really realistic stuff. Um, and that's okay. <laughs> You know what it makes me think of is what Dave Hickey used to say about how people respond to work and what you want as an artist. Yeah. You don't want, wow, huh? Yeah. You want, huh? Wow. Yeah. Oh, I like that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So the idea being that, you know, a good work of art should reveal itself over time yeah. and and kind of develop with you, grow with you and you should be able to, if you want to speak about it from a strictly like commercial point of view, as a collector, you should be able to buy a work of art and 10 years later still be getting something from it, right? Right. And not just look at it and think like, oh, that thing. Yeah. So that's, yeah, yeah I think that's what he was getting at there. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about your time working with him. That was in Las Vegas, right? Yeah. Yeah, I went to graduate school in Las Vegas to study under Dave, um, largely. I mean, I will admit all of my friends were accepted to graduate schools elsewhere mm -hmm. and time was running short and I hadn't made the decision whether I wanted to go to grad school. And then all of a sudden I started feeling super left out and realized I didn't have any other plan for life. So I probably yeah. should go to grad school. So I mentioned it to Vernon Fisher, who was, you know, both of our uh, teacher at UNT in undergrad and was like, you know, I don't know what to do. I mean, every, most deadlines have passed. And he said, well, I'm pretty sure that UNLV in Las Vegas is still accepting, mm -hmm. you know, that's where Dave Hickey is. And you really like his, uh, his writings, his essays at that time he had, published The Invisible Dragon. And um, we either read that in Vernon's class or I read it and discussed with Vernon. I can't remember, but he knew I was a fan. Yeah. And that uh, Dave's point of view would be a good fit for me. And so, yeah, he wrote a letter of recommendation. And so I ended up getting accepted and it came together really quickly. Like I moved out to Vegas. I had $800 in the bank. I wasn't even registered for classes. I'd been accepted, but I was, you know, I wasn't actually like, enrolled mm -hmm. you know and still had to uh i think it was because like classes weren't open you remember how classes yeah. would open and you would call yeah. oh my god so they hadn't opened yet but i just moved out i lived in a motel called the happy inn it was spelled h h a p p i i and not a y and um yeah then you know obviously enrolled in classes and was there for my graduate studies which were it was a three-year program there. So it was three years with Dave and it was amazing. You know, it was, mm -hmm. I, I happened to go out there right as he was, he was writing air guitar, which of course is his best known work. And um, he would test out those essays on us in class. Cause I had him, he was my, my graduate committee chair or lead, whatever they were called. So he's like my main mentor, but he also taught a con, temporary criticism class yeah. every semester that I always took and 
he would try those essays out on us and he would even say like he was working through some of the material or whatever before yeah. he published it in art issues which is where most of those appeared first um so those were special times for sure that's cool that's cool do you feel like um I don't feel like I really bonded with any of my professors at, at UNT and I did not go to grad school for various reasons. But um, so I know I don't feel like I ever had that kind of strong personal mentorship relationship. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like, did you get that kind of thing at UNT or do you feel like that happened for you once you got into grad school? Uh, I would say, I would say my peers were more important to me, like uh, our group of friends, the artists that I was immediately surrounded with had a greater impact on me than mm -hmm. other professors did in undergrad. Now, having said that, I mean, obviously Vernon Fisher was a huge presence in my life, you know, for good or bad, because the whole reason I went to UNT was because of Vernon. Mm -hmm. I was, I had grown up in Denton, uh, which is where UNT is, uh, for those of you listening. And so it was my hometown university. Um, and most people were leaving town, you know, wanting to go elsewhere out of state or whatever. And I remember in my senior year of um, high school, I went and saw Vernon's show at the Fort Worth Modern Art Museum and just fell in love with his work and was so impressed that there was somebody who was teaching in my hometown that was had been in the Whitney Biennial. I mean, I had probably just then learned what the Whitney Biennial is yeah. um, and was showing at a gallery in Dallas, which was a big deal. He showed at Barry Whistler Gallery and that, you know, that meant you made it in my mind. And Again, I'm learning all these things right then in real time. Like, oh, you can be an artist and show at a gallery and you can be in these museum shows and, and you can teach at a university and it's here in my hometown. And so he was really the reason I went there. Mm -hmm. And so I always had my sights set on um, studying under him. And he was so incredibly smart and talented. And, you know, as I don't have to tell you, he was an impressive person, but he was, you know, an asshole. And... He, um, he, he definitely supported me and encouraged me, but he would be so hard on me. And yeah. I remember that in my senior year, I had my like, final meeting with him and he just was shaking his head. And he said to me, you are so much smarter than this work. Yeah. And, I, and it was just like, yeah, it just cut me to the bone, you know? And again, it goes back right. to a time when, Everybody was so concerned with their work being conceptual and referencing post-structuralist and, and theory. being smart. Like that and was the super, measure. Yes, you had to be so yeah. smart. But and I feel like Vernon was part of like, you know, he set that tone. Mm -hmm. at, you know, I think that was a, a, a symptom. I don't know. That's not the right word. That was a, a feature of art and art school in the 90s. But also, yes. at, I think at UNT, it was um, particularly, you know, uh, present. And part of that was because of Vernon kind of setting that tone and then students emulating and and enacting that, you know. Oh, yeah, I mean, for sure. And, you know, look, I'm not naive. I know this stuff goes on at every art school. Mm hmm everywhere, maybe to a lesser degree today, although I fear not. And every school has its Vernon, but I mean, we all just clamored to impress him and, and you know, basically like crawled over each other for his yeah. <laughs> approval. And I mean, I can remember these critiques where he would come in and it would just be so fucking tense and everybody yeah. would be so worried and they'd have their work up on the walls. And I can, to this day, picture him coming in and just putting his head between his hands, like yeah. for a solid like four minutes, yeah. And then you go like, you know, just in total disappointment. I mean, we're laughing about it, but also it's not really funny either. I mean, and, no. and as an adult, and as an adult 
who has children and, you know, one of them's college age now. And, and I've like been in education my whole life, practically, like, you know, either mm -hmm. directly or peripherally, like there's a part of me that is just like, that's so not okay, you know, for right. a teacher to, uh, to create that level of tension you know, mm -hmm. in the classroom, it's a hostile environment. It was a hostile environment, you know, 100%. Um, yeah. And one of the things I was hoping that you and I would, would uh, talk about is Vernon's. I wanted to get yeah. your, your take on those days and you just laid it out yeah. very nicely right there. I mean, I so wow. much respect for, for his artwork and like, yes. you know, I admired it too, but I have to confess that by that point in my experience in art school, I was done. Like I was, mm -hmm. I was done and I was not feeling it. And I wasn't, uh, thinking that I wanted to continue just because like a lot of it was because of that atmosphere and, mm -hmm. um, and also some of the stuff that went on in good, bad, which we'll just kind of leave that there. Like, love <laughs> it, love it. Also, it right, was, right. and, yes. um, and by the time I got into Vernon's class, my my reaction was like when he would come into the room and do that and the, uh, like and feel <laughs> like it was this air of like do I really have to do this again do I really yes. have to be here and my my response was well if you're gonna check out I'm gonna check out like I don't want to yeah. interact with you if you're gonna be like that I didn't mm -hmm. like one time I went to his office hours the whole semester that we had that class, like, and it was the last week. <laughs> I just, I just didn't want to interact with him and I didn't, mm -hmm. and I probably squandered an opportunity there, but, um, you know, I... that's like, that was part of that atmosphere that he created. And then when we had our meeting, finally, actually it was very complimentary because at that point I had started doing more writing and I would mm -hmm. turn in writing instead of paintings and other art students would like get pissed off at me because I was like a painting and drawing major. And why am I turning in a short story, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, but he was actually really complimentary of my writing and encouraged me to keep doing that. And I think that was ended up being a very meaningful thing you know um, well that's good to hear and that yeah. mirrors my own experience basically because he did write this glowing recommendation uh, to dave hickey you know his very good friend and um and if it hadn't been for that i i wouldn't have gotten into unlv i wouldn't have known dave who, who yeah you know has had the biggest impact on me as an artist, if anybody ever, you know, both artistically and personally. Um, and I know that, you know, in some ways, Vernon uh, it seems too emotional to say that he was proud of me. But later on, when I became the curator at Playboy, cur you know, in charge of the art collection mm -hmm. there, the corporate curator there, for some reason, I was in contact with him and I sent him a picture of myself standing next to you know uh, a work of art that had a playboy bunny in it and uh -huh. dave told me years later that that was hanging in his studio like oh, really? years later wow. that was hanging in his studio and you know that that made me feel really good and yeah so but it doesn't change the fact that like he could have been nicer and yeah. when i when i think about the the young people that I've had the opportunity to mentor in various roles, like when I've worked as a curator or in, or in other situations, when the opportunity arises, you know, I've always tried to just say, it's okay to be nice. You know, it doesn't yeah. cost anything to be nice. Yeah. And also at the same time explaining that it's just art. It's right. not that serious. It's not life or death, you know, like, yeah. There's a small portion of the world that cares about it. The people yeah. who care about it really care about it. But like, we're not curing cancer and it's okay. Yeah. Like everybody's going to be okay. <laughs> so I feel um, like too, there was this sense of, um, and Chris Kaiser and I talked about this a little bit, like 
um, that the lack of kindness in criticism uh, was a way to prepare you for the, like, <laughs> how brutal the art world can be and yes. and how brutal the world can be. And you've got to have tough skin, especially as an artist, when you're everybody's going to be critiquing and reviewing your work and telling you you're mm -hmm. crap or not. And, um, and it makes sense, but also it to, you know, now in 2024, through everything that we've been through in the past decade, especially, um, it's just to me, a, a reflection of this, uh, like the patriarchy, basically, mm -hmm. you know, of that, like, um, the, the beatings will continue until morale improves, you know, it's just like, it's, yes. it's like tough love is the only way to go. And, um, mm -hmm. that that's a very like unhealthy, uh, patriarchal quality, you know, um, that I think just was a feature of art school at the, that time, you know, like there was no way. Yes, absolutely. And I think that ties right into the fact that there were so few platforms through which you could show your work or gain approval or develop an audience as an artist. And, you know, the levers of power were all, you know, they were concentrated in a very small group of museum curators, you know, dealers and, and art magazines. And, yeah. you know, in those days, I mean, I've tried to tell younger artists what it was like and, you know, those whose eyes don't just glaze over right. immediately <laughs> when grandpa gets to talking are kind of dumbfounded when I tell them that like, yeah, back then, you know, there was no social media or anything. So you had to just hope that you would get a show at one of these four galleries. Yeah. And maybe you would get a museum, you know, in a group show at a museum and, and then someday you'd be in the Whitney Biennial and, you know, yeah. you'd be mentioned in art forum or whatever. And I know most of these things still exist, but as we said, um, <clears throat> at the beginning of this conversation, you have all these other ways to get your work out there now. And there are artists, some artists who just exist on Instagram and they do really well for themselves and they have huge audiences and they make great work. And, yeah. you know, and um, at the same time, galleries, I know that, you know, the many galleries are struggling right now after COVID, but there are so many more galleries than there were in those days, spread across a lot more cities and countries, et cetera, you know, and it's not just these four galleries in New right. York or- And it's, yeah, it's, it's being oh. decentralized from New York. Exactly, yeah. New York is still the powerhouse, but right. I do but love- you can do it, you can do it from anywhere. I mean, yeah, basically. I mean, there's like some very, like, I can think of five little, towns in texas right now that you would never think of as having like a good quality art gallery and i'm not including marfa because everyone knows about mm -hmm. marfa. like other towns that that people haven't heard of that have like a really good gallery you know it's it's odd um mm -hmm. but cool you know um yeah, i don't know, you know that they have like the local support There you are. Hey, sorry. That's I lost okay. my Wi-Fi signal, so I had to set up a hotspot. Okay. We were talking about the art world becoming decentralized and the proliferation of galleries. Yes. Yeah. So as a young artist, I mean, there's so many ways to get your work out there now. Yeah. And I don't know what it's like in Texas, but here in Chicago, there's this huge kind of you know, pop-up gallery scene mm -hmm. and artists run a gallery scene and kind of do it yourself mentality Yeah. Um, where you'll have these shows that just pop up for a couple of days, you know, in a warehouse or the back of a yoga studio where it's transformed. It's kind of like good, bad, one night only thing. You no, know, it's just, yes, exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's okay that the stakes aren't so high that 
you know, maybe the curator of the Whitney Biennial is going to come or, you know, it's, yeah. it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah. Um, every time you show your work. And so to go back to the critiques, you know, it just makes me think about how when I went to UNLV, we didn't have critiques. Mm. Dave was very anti-critique. Yeah. And it just goes to show you that even in the 90s, you know, there were schools of thought on how you teach artists and, you know, how you respond to work in an educational setting. And, um, you know, he, he, his feeling about critiques was that they always would, um, you'd end up spending the most amount of time on the worst works. Right. Because like, let's say Lisa brings in a really great painting. Everybody's just kind of going to, going to kind of go like, Oh, wow. Cool. You, you should make more of these. Are yeah. you going to make more of these? And then that's it. Right. But his example that he'd love to give, um, if you go back and listen to any of his old lectures, which I recently did, you know, just for fun, it comes up a lot in those talks from the nineties. Mm -hmm. The example being that, uh, you know, someone once brought in a piece of plywood with the word boogie written on it Yeah. to a, to a critique that he attended when he was a visiting a lecturer at a, another university. And he said that they spent like two hours talking about this piece of plywood with the boogie on it. Right. And, you know, I mean, that's maybe a little unfair or it's, you know, he's playing it for comedy somewhat, but there's a lot of truth in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, I just remember that environment was just, it was just uh, so anxiety provoking. I would be like so nervous beforehand and then basically in tears afterwards. And right. so, you so know, a lot of the work structure his, his teaching. So, I mean, really the only group setting in which he taught would was his criticism class that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we were always welcome to interrupt and ask questions and so on. And then there'd usually be a discussion at the end. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he was a big smoker. So he would be outside of class smoking beforehand, middle, you know, during the break and afterwards. And students always like hung out to curry favor with him or to get him to try to get him to laugh at their jokes or whatever which was, you know, um, always a nice ego stroke if that happened. And, and that's where you often would learn the most from him because he yeah. would just toss off these comments um, that would resonate, you know, for weeks or months or years right. or whatever. And so we didn't have group crit critiques and there was no other setting other than maybe your thesis show where people would come and look at your work. You would always just be in your studio making your work or attending class. So, yeah, that's cool. I will say that cr the critiques, um, you know, going into like a co corporate design world, they prepared me for that because mm -hmm. you have to present your ideas to the stakeholders um and that could be as rough as a critique <laughs> actually rougher <laughs> um right and a lot of you know a lot of the times the the feedback would be like well purple is a terrible color you know like that's <laughs> what you would get and so it was like that like learning how to to speak to what you're presenting was something that i i do think that like as brutal as they were that um was helpful for me later in my life now whether or not like saying that mm -hmm. pitching ideas in a corporate setting which is known to be not a healthy setting says a whole lot <laughs> mm -hmm. but it did have some practical uses for me i'll say yeah i think that that's a good insight i mean i ended up in the corporate world as i mentioned um and worked for many companies in creative roles and yeah i could say that like it probably was it made it easier for me to weather those storms of you know big meetings where mm -hmm. i had to present things and get the feedback of the higher ups or whatever but the Distinction I would make is just that with with Vernon, 
you know, it was just extra. He was always just very extra with this kind of disapproval and criticism. And I think personally, and I mean, only my opinion, but I think there was just a little edge of like self-loathing in Vernon's case where he regretted his decision to be a professor and to some degree maybe regretted his decision to be an artist and, and found himself in this situation where he was now a painter, very smart one, but a painter working in the nineties in a, you know, hot house of conceptual art, you know, yeah. and post-structuralist theory and, and at, during at the time UNT, when painting was like, which isn't, wasn't yes, the that UNT. prestigious of an art school, you know, so. Right, you know, right. I, I and, can see that. You know, he didn't want us to paint. I mean, he, he wouldn't outright tell you not to do it, but it was pretty clear that he thought it was a bad idea and that you should be doing video art, you should be doing performance art or something right. that's, you know, more conceptual. But yet here he was as a painter, right? So on the one hand, I was always inspired by that. Like he found a lane, you know, through which he was able to be both a painter and a pretty heady, smart artist, you know, whose work lent itself to conceptual readings and stuff. And he had been in the Whitney Biennial. So he's like threading this needle yeah. of being a very talented painter, but at the same time being seen as a, you know, a smart guy and a smart artist, which was kind of impossible for most other artists at the time. So I admired that in him, but at the same time, I was always like, hey, you know, I mean, you're kind of making it seem like I shouldn't paint and you're over here making these paintings. And so I do think we're saying the same thing that there was a part of him that was kind of like, you shouldn't have chosen this as a life. Right. Because it sucks. Yeah. And what you have, I'm really going to drive home how much it sucks. Yeah. And, you know, if you're really lucky, maybe you'll come out the other end of it. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know that, um, yeah, that it needs to be that, you know, yeah. that harsh because it breaks a lot of people, a lot of artists, yes. you know, don't, ever make work again i mean yeah i i, I so, fully didn't make artwork for like 20 years you know and um mm -hmm. it wasn't directly because of that but it was also directly because of that you know it was it was more reaction to the atmosphere and a, a sense of mm -hmm. like if this is what the art world is like i don't want to be a part of it you know um and I do feel like, you know, now as 51 year old Lisa, um, who's been through some stuff and has a, a different level of knowing myself and have tested having to be in difficult situations, you know, like um, wishing that I had had more of like a fortitude and, uh, and trust in my own self, you know, mm -hmm. rather than deferring to, to what was and what the like authority, uh, was saying, but also I don't really regret it either. Like, I, I feel like the, the stepping away and being in a different aspect of life, um, is actually enriching like my experience as an artist now. You know, it would have been like, you, you can't do the what if thing, like who knows what it would have been like before, but I could have easily been totally burning out on art, you know, at this point in my life. And, um, mm -hmm. and I'm extremely happy to be returning to it, you know, instead. So with like this well, wealth of experience. We're so glad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're so glad that we have you back in the art world and <laughs> you and I can Thanks. relate on this front because you, we can relate on this front because, you know, I also took some time off. I mean, I did soldier on after undergrad with graduate school, as we discussed. And then, you know, I was lucky to show at a gallery um, right out of graduate school and be in some good group shows and a couple museum shows and really thought, you know, my career was taking off. And then yeah. at the same time, I realized now that I was out of school and out of that protective bubble, I needed to pay my rent. And so I started working, you know, at companies and different roles to do that. And, 
the, you know, these paths sort of diverged where my art career was kind of hitting a lull yeah. and I was starting to, you know, go down this like adult career path. And so, you know, for me, it was a combination of like life intervened and and now was a curator someplace, you know, that kind of took over and, but also at the same time, yeah, becoming kind of cynical and I was sort of burned out and, and um, decided that I needed to take a break from it. And there was a long period where you know, once social media became a thing and I saw our friends posting art mm-hmm. on Facebook initially and then, and then Instagram, you know, there was a period where I'd even see that and I'd think like, wow, this guy is still super into art. Yeah. Like good for him, you know, yeah. <laughs> because even though I was as a curator, I, I was, you know, dealing with art on a daily basis, which I loved uh, as a practitioner, I had completely detached myself from it. Mm-hmm. And then slowly I started to get the, the, the itch and the desire and the creative impulse came back. And I found myself thinking about like, well, what would I do and what would I make? And, and then I realized like, you know, I missed it. I actually really missed it. And yeah. I wanted to do it again, but I wanted to do it for my reasons, you know, and even though that sounds cheesy or whatever, I wanted, I wanted to come back to it under my own terms, I wanted to make the things I wanted to make. And so the, the drawings that I make now really stem from drawings that I made in Vernon's class mm-hmm. that he very much disliked. Yeah. And, and he told me to stop making yeah. And so one of those I had kept, I still have it. And I would always go and look at it and think like, this is actually really cool. Like, I really like this, yeah. what this drawing is doing and would love to revisit it someday. And so really all of my current work s- stems from those drawings that I yeah. felt, you know, in, I felt discouraged from making and embarrassed to make uh-huh. um, when I was a young artist. And now I'm like, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And Hopefully there's an audience for it. Yeah, I think there, I think there is. Um, I found this photo. This is from from a show at Goodback. And it's like from this, I mean, you can definitely see your current work in, in there, I think, but it's like from this era where there were like all these little sections and tunnels and like Uh lines connecting things that I always was very drawn to that you know it was like creating either create literally kind of creating a world through all these kind of like secret passages or Mm -hmm. it's like a concept map you know where you've got the bubbles connecting the other bubbles and um I just was very drawn to like that graphic nature of it of like ideas within ideas and things within things and scrolls within woodland mm-hmm. creatures hands and like whatever it's just like um, <laughs> there's something very appealing about all of that well it's- todd todd ramsel and i used to sit around and and yet draw like one image and then like a bubble coming off with another image yeah. and it's just a fun way to like associate different elements yeah disparate elements and create these meanings and you know i think there was also some christian schumann i don't know if you remember that artist but he was a young artist not much older than we were who was in art in america when we were in undergrad and mm. and his work was heavily influenced by comics and lowbrow and painting that you showed is one that i still look at a lot I, yeah I'll, i look at it quite a bit because there are a couple of little sections in there that i think uh-huh. about recreating as just individual elements like yeah. individual heads similar yeah. to the work that i make now but um well, I know you have a hard stop coming up, um, so I won't keep you from that. But um, I will just say that I've I've really like I had noticed that there's been an increase in like what you're putting out there, and it's been very lovely to see. And um, you know, well, thank you. like right back at you as far as like the world is very happy that you're making art again. And, and to the degree that you are now. So um, it's cool. I love it. And- well, I appreciate that. And it's so nice to speak to another artist 
about art and yeah. get into the weeds about this stuff, but especially nice to speak to you given our shared history. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's always so nice to have a sounding board. Yeah. And ask like, did I experience that? Is that right. really how it was? And I that's think, what you've given me. <laughs> I feel like, you know, with these conversations, um, and I've been, you know, trying to use this this form format as a way to like expand my community, you know, like get to know new people, but also reconnect with people from my past. And I've been mm -hmm. doing a lot of that in, in the past couple of months. And um, it does seem like that a lot of us who were in art school together at that time have some things that we need to talk about, <laughs> you know, like whether we fully <laughs> realize it or not, um, like there's some, some stuff that, um, has been a little be in our bonnets that we need. It's just, I mm -hmm. like, I feel like this conversation was very, very helpful for me. Like I'll probably be able to just like let go of some crappy energy that I've been carrying and didn't need to. Yeah. Same. So, yeah. Same. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's just, um, I don't know. It's just really nice, nice to know that you can come out the other side. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> and that, uh, I mean, there's, the door is never closed. Like if you're an artist, you're always an artist, even though, you know, for those years I would tell people literally say to them, like, I'm not an artist anymore when they would start t talking to me about art. Um, but the truth is you, you are, always are an artist. Yeah. If Even if you're not making something, you're an artist in the way that you look at the world and yes. think about the world and kind of process your experiences. So always lovely to chat with another artist. Yeah. I'm glad that you reached out and, yeah. and made this happen. Yeah.